I live my life like there's no tomorrow. I got a drink in my hand. I got my toes in the sand, and all I na 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 need is a beautiful woman. You can't get romantic on a subway line. That's when push comes to shove. Senorita, I'm in trouble again, and I can't get free. You're exactly what the doctor ordered. Come on, talk to me. Say you're going to leave me because I only tie you up. I always loved you tender, but you only like it rough. So, baby, dry your eyes. Save all the tears you've cried. Oh, that's what dreams are made of. If you want to see other guys, baby, I could let it slide. You want a lover? You want a friend? Mama, I can be both of them. Miss the beat, you'll lose the rhythm, and nothing falls into place. No! Only missed by a fraction. Slipped a little off your pace. Oh, I seen the damage done. Down with the shotgun. Don't stop the setting sun of my kingdom. Come. There is just enough Christ in me to make me feel almost guilty. Is that why God made us breed? To make us see where humans being? Fork tongue and double speak. Pretty soon you just might spring a leak. Inhale before you begin. Your iron lugs a bag of wind. I'm done with coexisting. This is heavy lifting. No more codependent over you. And baby, while we at it, I've had it with you and your blues. Welcome to the Van Halen Record Exchange. This is a Van Halen podcast. I'm David Lawler. I just did all that, and I kind of screwed up on the whole thing at the end. Well, let me say this. Number two, I am John Fralick, but let me at least say this. I am proud, very proud, that you incorporated some fire in the hole lyrics right there. I figured I figured you would appreciate the fire in the hole. Thank you very much. This is John Fralick. He is my co-host, and really kind of my raison d'etre for this whole thing because this is the this is one of the things that we have in common is van halen and also movies good and bad but but we're doing this thing too um so what what is this going to be john what are we doing here explain we're it just going to be explain it for the slower people in the audience we just feel the need to talk about every album individually in not so great detail but in decent detail just to give you a our feelings, our opinions on on whether or not these are good albums. I mean, they're pretty much all good albums. Pretty right? much. I mean, like the standard. Yes, the standard is very high anyway, even for the worst of them. But I think we can all agree that at the way bottom of the list is Van Halen Three, <laughs> even though it has like a couple of good tracks. Well, it has couple. fire in the hole anyway. Oh, and yeah, also, has... you know, I mean, I really do, I do dig without you. Like, like I, I will save it for when we get there. But like, I listened to Van Halen Three again over the weekend. I'm like, you know, there's a couple of good tracks on there. Right? There's some a good couple. stuff. Yeah, I guess, I guess. All right, we should go into the episode proper. So I'm going to put on my headphones here. Everybody, put on your headphones out there in TV land. And you're listening to Dave TV. I'm Dave, by the way, <laughs> in the Dave TV thing. We're talking about, uh, this is the first, it's it's an unofficial record, but it's something that is on every bootlegger's shelf and every big Van Halen fan's uh, um, cassette deck, or even, they might even have it on vinyl, because I remember a friend of mine had it from way back and uh, gave me a copy, and I have a, a copy of it on cassette down in the basement, but I don't really go down the basement anymore. So I'm just looking at it on YouTube these days, but this is a complete zero, and we're not talking about the 11 tracks on it that Gene Simmons produced, but like pretty much the summation of all the demos at that point. And they were all good demos. I mean, there were a lot of really good you know, building blocks there. Right. One of my favorite building blocks is like Mean Street and uh, what's that other song? Oh, uh, it was two songs that basically became Mean Street. It was two separate songs that. Well, there was Mean okay. Street. There was there was a song in the Gene Simmons demo. I think it might have been let. Uh, no, no, I think it might have been um, Big Trouble, where okay. you hear a little bit of that Mean Street guitar solo in there. You know, brown, you know, brown. I'm just I'm gonna I'm gonna double check on that right now because I can hear it. So let's see, uh, where does it say? Okay, Voodoo Queen becomes Mean Street. Yeah, yeah. But that's a Ted Templeman demo, though. Oh, that is a Ted Templeman demo. Okay. Okay, she's the one. She's the woman. She's the woman. Oh, you think it's she's the woman? Okay, she's the woman. Well, it's, yeah, yeah. But there there was something in the Gene Simmons uh, demo, in in the earlier demo. I think now that what happened was because of this. This is a really good compilation of things. The only problem is, of course, it's a demo, so it doesn't sound that great. But you could really clean this up and make a really good record off of it if you wanted to. I I think if, uh, well, right now, I think everything lies with Alex and Wolfgang, probably. Probably, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I highly doubt Valerie has anything to it, but uh, Alex and Wolfgang, they can do whatever they want. Maybe they could find those tapes, clean them up. I don't know. I, do you them. think, don't you think that uh, that Gene Simmons owns this uh, first demo? More than uh, anything. He did produce it. He did finance he did it. Produce it. They so did he not have their company yet. Remember, they had a company, Van Halen yeah. Publishing or whatever it was. So probably, yeah, Gene, no, well, maybe. Hey, Gene Simmons is always money hungry. Maybe he should put those demos. Yeah, out I know. There. Well, you would think it, because Gene Simmons, we know what kind of guy Gene Simmons is. He's a guy who doesn't even wait for the body to get cold before he starts trying to make money off of it. That's a man with no fucking shame, right? He there. has a Kiss credit card. There's a Kiss credit card with 14 percent interest. You can get it. I'm Gene Simmons, and I will finance this credit card for you. <laughs> but uh, okay, well, we have to go back to the beginning because this is zero. This is one. Eh, eh, this is great. I'm really, I'm really happy to be doing this uh, because we get to go back to the beginning. And when you, when you, when you listen to the demo, okay, it was produced. I think they went to Electric Lady in New York for these eleven songs. And Gene Simmons produced it, and David Wh- Dave, Dave Whitman en- engineered it. And if you listen to it, you can definitely. And you told me this. You told me this when you listened to it. You said this is very Kiss. This sounds it's, a lot like Kiss. It doesn't, well, the lyrics, not ways, but like, oh, the guitar and the bass, like it just has that Kiss vibe to it. It has, you know what it reminded me of was the solo album, the Gene Simmons solo album. And from what I understand, actually, in 77, um, Simmons had Eddie and Alex, and he wanted them on a couple of demos that he did. He did, what did he do? He did Got Love for Sale, he did Christine 16, and he did maybe Tunnel of Love for the solo album. I'm not sure if it was Tunnel of Love. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. Now, when you listen to those songs, and then you listen to songs like, well, She's a Woman, Big Trouble, Babe Don't Leave Me Alone, and Put Out the Lights, they're very Gene Simmons solo record kind of songs. That's what they sound like to me. A little bit, but except you don't have Sharon When You Wish Upon a Star. I guess not. Or Donna Summer, or Diana Ross, or God knows who else he screwed back then. Screwed a few people. I just always, I just always <laughs> thought it was that Gene Simmons album was pretty decent, but it got really off kilter when he sang "When You Wish Upon a Star" at the very end. I yeah, a lot of people say that. I don't mind. I don't mind it. For me, it was like a palate cleanser because the record is very interesting. It's a very interesting solo record because it's it's Gene unchained, if you will. It's Gene without the band, so he has this kind of theatrical thing. He's got like this meatloaf slash Bob Seger kind of, an Aerosmith kind of feel to it. Because Joe Perry does play on it too, right? I, th- I think you and I can both agree that Ace Frehley had the best solo album out of all four. Well, Ace Frehley is my personal favorite of all four of them. I, I Yeah, the Ace Frehley solo album is my favorite of the four, but followed very closely by Paul and Gene's. I, I do enjoy Paul's record quite a bit. It's very kind of California new wave rock pop kind of a thing, kind of like Rick Springfield or something. I think we can both agree that Peter Chris's is probably the, the, the nah, least popular. Peter Chris's album is not that great. Like, dude, he got he got lucky twice and could sing. He belted out two good ballads, but as one of those guys who's like, "Don't quit your day job, dude. You're a better drummer than your singer. You're a drummer." Uh, unlike kind, unlike kind Ace. Of like how Kind of like how Eddie Van Halen sang freaking How Many Say I at the end of Van Halen 3, and everyone's just like, what the fuck, Eddie? <laughs> you like, know, it's why, great stuff. why are you singing? You, you, like, dude, you're background singer. You ain't no real yeah, singer. Yeah, Eddie, okay? Eddie, Eddie is a harmonizer. He harmonizes, and that's that signature sound of, of Van Halen is the harmony, that harmony sound. And it was something that my wife always commented on because she always loved that, that, those harmonies. And what that harmony? Eddie, Eddie and Mike, man. Eddie and Mike on harmony. Are Eddie amazing. and Mike. It is Mike. Mike is. I think Mike. Michael Anthony is the secret sauce of those harmonies. Because when you listen to him, he's like, ah, he does that. He's the one who does that, ah, you know, thing. And then when you combine that with with Eddie Van Halen and Alex, you you get this incredible, miraculous sound on the harmony. And that that was what was so wonderful about a lot of Van Halen songs is that. It, it's what separated them from everybody else, really, right? Yeah, and the harmonies really helped carry Dave. Yeah, and and you can hear you can hear David Lee Roth in the harmony of the of the records that he's doing, but then you can hear Sammy Hagar in the harmony too, when he right. when he joins the band. So it's a it, it's slightly different, but as long as Michael's there, I think Michael is the is the main. Like I said, he's the secret sauce. 
And each of those harmonies are very distinctive. Sammy's specifically because he has very, very good harm, a harmonic voice. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, he has a nice anthemic voice and at the same time, a very nice harmonic voice. So, I mean, I'm sorry. That's why Van Hagar has always been my personal favorite. Yeah, I mean, a, lot of people hate, a lot of people hate me for it. That's fine. It's hard to it's hear, fine. but I, I can understand. I mean, I can, I, you know, but I know a lot of people. I mean, are gonna... I, I will. I will say this, though. They they rocked so much harder when they had fucking David. Well, yeah, I, I, I think it was probably because they had to do double duty because Sammy did play guitar when he was with them live. He would play he guitar. Did, well, he did, yeah, because, like, uh, what is it? Well, Sammy only played guitar a couple of times, but I know, like, on the rhythm he played, there were a lot of songs. I think, uh, what is it, Finish What You Started was, like, the only Van Halen song he ever actually recorded rhythm guitar on. Um, maybe acoustic, but, but we knew, we do know on the first album that David played uh, acoustic guitar on Ice Cream Man, and I believe he might have played acoustic guitar in a little bit of... Um, what was it? Take your whiskey home from women and children first. I'm not sure. Okay. But in the uh, in the zero album, the zero album is such a blueprint. It's like you know what this you know what this. I, I was just gonna say this is the blueprint for the first four Van Halen albums. Which is five years when you think about it. It's a five year plan. This record, because uh, uh, with the exception of House of Pain, which they decided to use, it's interesting that House of Pain uh, precedes Running with the Devil on this on this uh, zero record. And that the the horns from House of Pain go into Running with the Devil. Running with the Devil was the first song on an official sanctioned Van Halen release. House of Pain was the last song on the final David Lee Roth record. That's kind of ironic when you think about it. Yeah, and House of Pain, actually, you know, I gotta say, House of Pain on Zero, it, I like it much more than House of Pain on, on 1984. I don't like the 1984 version as much. Yeah, House of Pain is really not one of my favorite. Like, dude, my whole thing with 1984, that whole record's good. House of Pain is just kind of like, while it's decent, it's not a good closer. Girl Girl Gone Bad should have been the closer. What I think Simmons did the right thing here with, with the House of Pain on the Zero demo because it has that riff first and foremost, which is... You know, whereas... The House of Pain on 1984 is a little kind of lost in the mix. It's not as hard as it should be. I just, the one thing I've always liked about, like, after I heard Zero, I'm just like, yeah, you could really tell that after Fair Warning, they painted themselves into a corner with Diver Down. They did. You know what? That point, that period, between Fair Warning and Diver Down was their lost year right there because you feel like they ran they didn't know where they were going at that point. And that's why Diver Down is mostly covers. It's like more than half of the record is covers. They only had a couple of original tunes, and even those were just things they were kicking around in the fair warning years. Yeah, they they even said that like the record company really wanted them to get an album out, and they basically said, okay, well, we only get this much real. It's okay, do covers. It's fine. We yeah. just want you to get a new album out there. That's why I said it felt like a contractual obligation album. Just get it out there. It's another album on the contract, get it over with. And also, I think they might have been having problems with, because David Lee Roth wanted to be, I guess. He didn't like the synths. He didn't like synthesizers and he didn't like outside projects and he, and he wanted to be more of a showman, a pop artist. And Diver Down is a very pop album. That's why Diver Down is really low on my list. And 1984 is, is also not as high as a lot of other... If you look at a lot of other Van Halen fans' lists, 1984 is like number one or number two on the list. And that's probably because it was the most popular at the time. It was a 10 million. That, that record sold 10 million copies. And the only other record to sell that many was the first Van Halen record. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting, then, too, when you think then about it. And then 1984 consistently got knocked out of the number one spot because of a uh, thriller because of thriller and but at least it, but at least jump got number one single so yeah yeah that's true but it might have been it might have been that might have been the peak but here in this blueprint of a rock band it's uh this okay the thing is i don't know for some reason over the years the band members have kind of marginalized gene simmons contributions of the band but the simple truth is that he did spot them he did discover them they were playing at the Starwood. They had like this gig. It was kind of like a residency almost at the Starwood where they would play. 
several mm-hmm. nights a week, and they would just and and apparently I guess Gene Simmons was there, probably trying to bang a chick or something, and uh, he um, he discovered them. I mean, he's responsible for discovering them, so that he brings them out to New York. He finances their demo, he produces it, uh, and then it just disappears. Nobody wants to listen to him. Bill Coin, the Kiss manager, doesn't want to take them on. Yeah, and that and you know that's really where it's like, dude, Gene's got so much pull. You'd figure he could get Casablanca. Uh, what's whatever space is Neil Bogart? Even Neil freaking, Bogart, yeah, yeah. But, Neil no, Bogart but they were dying I, at that point. Casablanca was not taking on any more uh, new acts because they were putting well, no, all if, their money up their nose at that point. If this was '76, they had already Casablanca had hit because Kiss Alive had just came out. Yeah, and that was like. And that was like. But back the, then, what did you do? What did you do when you made a lot of money? You got a big bowl of cocaine, and you just put yeah. it in the room, and you had parties. You know, they were really well, bad. They yeah. were terrible. They were terrible at managing money. Yeah, they were horribly managed. Even I know that. I mean, then they became a disco label. Like that was the other problem. I think like right after Kiss hit it big, they didn't want to sign a rock act. They just wanted to become this fucking disco label. Yeah, the only which, other... Which, um, in essence, makes sense. It makes perfect There was only sense. one other hard rock band on the label at the time, and that was this band called Angel. Do you remember them? No, I do not. That was... They were... They had, like, one top 40 hit, but you can mainly hear them on the soundtrack of a movie that Jodie Foster made called Boxes. With Okay, uh, I know that movie. With uh, Sherry Curry, I think, is in it, too. Okay. They couldn't even sign. That, that was another thing. Casablanca couldn't even sign um, the Runaways. The Runaways yeah. got a deal with, I think, Mercury or something, right? I don't even know who, the deal they got, whoever they signed with. That's but just, they were really. I thought it may have been EMI, for all I know. Damn, I gotta look it up. Apparently, <laughs> so let me yeah, say. So, yeah, so do I. I mean, because I know Joan Jett was on EMI. That much I know. At least I think she was on EMI. The Runaways. Uh, let's see what their primary label was. I'm not even sure. But um, Mercury Rhino. There oh, you go. Was, yeah, Mercury, Mercury and you're right. Rhino. You were 100 percent right. It was Mercury. Also, Cherry Red, which was uh, I think Kim Fowley's like specialty boutique boutique label. They wrote a song that was originally going to go to the Runaways called "Flaming Youth." With Ace Frilly, I think, co-wrote it. And and it was supposed to go to the Runaways. It went to Kiss for their Destroyer record. Well, sucks to be them. Yeah, I guess it does. Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, they're kind of like the New York Dolls or something like that. They're very influential, but they never made any money. So it's really kind of funny when you think of it. Funny and sad sure. and tragic. Well, that's like, but then time. there's a lot of other bands like that. I mean, you, okay, one, of, uh, one we talked about are Quiet Riot's another band like that. Influential because they broke out hair metal, right? But did they make any money? No, because their management took half their fucking money. Yeah, yeah, I forget. Who was it who was in Quiet Riot? Randy Rhodes at the beginning, Randy right? Randy Rhodes, the original Quiet Riot. The original Riot. Quiet Riot before Metal Health came out, and then Metal Health was like a big hit. But it didn't go, none of that money went to them. It went to Epic in Columbia, I think. Yeah, it was uh, Pasha Records. It was that. It was this Epic subsidiary, but it was mainly the guy who ran Pasha got 50% of their money. yeah. It was like you talk about again influential bands getting bad deals. At least Van Halen got a good fucking deal. They got a good deal. You know what? Okay, this is very important because I was thinking about this, and I we have four minutes left to talk about this particular record. Uh, David Lee Roth on the Joe Rogan Show said that the reason uh, Van Halen did as well as they did mainly had to do with their versatility. They were able to get out there and they were able to do all kinds of music. They did mainly if you listen to a lot of Van Halen. It's Hispanic. There are Hispanic beats. There's country rock. There's psychobilly. There's rockabilly. There's good old fashioned rock and roll. And and there's classical. A little bit of classical in there too. It was anything that they could do. And they were like they were doing top forty music too. Anything that was mm-hmm. popular at the time. So they managed to get gigs. And because they managed to get gigs, they they, they got a lot of. Um, they, he said that anything that they could do that was within two hour driving distance. And that's how they did it. They would go out to any place. It was like the Blues Brothers. You remember the Blues Brothers in the movie? They go into this country bar. Bob, Bob's Country Bunker. Yeah. And what did they say? Rawhide. Let's do the theme from Rawhide. You know that one? <laughs> so they're just they're doing Rawhide. That was that was Van Halen back in the day. That's what they did. I still no a little off tangent. I still want to see the original cut that had Sink the Bismarck. It does not exist. Sink the Bismarck. 
because they because <laughs> they actually did do sync the Bismarck and the Blues Brothers audio still exists. I have it, but they said they cannot find the, the film. They can't find it. Oh, That's, probably got lost in the tragic Universal got, fire or whatever. It, it got well. <laughs> I, John just luckily saved some of that, but but what was it? One of my, one thing I want to close out on. One thing we always talked about how Van Halen got this really good deal, and you could always thank Eddie and Alex's father because uh, you Yon. know the Jazz. You know the Jazari story, right? Uh, refresh my memory. So Eddie, Eddie's dad, Eddie and Alex's dad, ran this club or worked in this club called Jazari's. It was back in like the late '60s, early '70s. And then this is Alex, in the states. Eddie, in the states. This is in the states. It was Jazari's. It was in the states. And then Eddie and Alex are just there, and then they get up on stage and they start. You know, Eddie at the time was playing drums, so he starts banging around the drums. Alex starts playing on guitar, and then they play this music, and all of a sudden. Uh, they put the they put this hat out, and then all the patrons throw money in the hat. Ah. And then when their set's over, Eddie and Alex's dad comes up to him, and he hands each of them five bucks. And then he goes, "Wait a second. Eddie's like, "Wait a second, Dad. There's all this money in the hat. Five and five equals ten. Where's the rest of the money go?" Their father looks at him and says, "Guys, welcome to the music business." <laughs> Well, he had it. He was right about and that. that. And, they, and, that is, and that is how Eddie and Alex were able to get a good a good record deal. Because and, their and, father totally uh, screwed them, basically. <laughs> out of in, their... a, in a sense, but it's it's just I love that story. I well, love they the did design. they did manage to get their dad for Big Bad Bill, <laughs> which was nice. A few year a few years before he died, which was which was good. Anyway, this uh, this is. Uh, about the end of the episode, I want to say, and uh, like I said, this is a really good—it's a really good demo. I mean, I can't believe that it was ignored. And then finally, I think Ted Templeman and Mo Austin—they may not admit to it, um, but they—but they did probably listen to this demo a little bit. And then they recorded some more stuff, which you can hear definitely. There's a definite signature change in the sound quality and how it's recorded. You, you start to hear it after Put Out the Lights. Uh, and then when we get into We Die Bold, that's the Ted Templeman stuff, you can tell. Because it's kind of a rough, it's a rough version of, of how we would hear Van Halen in the future. What are your thoughts on this demo? I mean, I think it's a great time capsule of an early band in their prime. A lot of good stuff that you listen to that became great songs. And then you hear some stuff that's, well, I'm glad this stayed a demo. And I'm glad nothing ever came out of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, I mean, I've heard a lot of demos like that. I mean, some demos I've heard they're they're better than the original. It's like, why did you use this one? Why didn't you use the demo? You know. But in this case, they're great demos. Everybody should listen to them. Get a get a nice little time capsule of what Van Halen used to be before they were a signed band. 